Here's Ed Bernstein. In two weeks, early voting begins. October 20th begins early voting. And in that regard, it starts our series of political interviews every week. This week, uh, S uh, Senate Majority Leader, I almost called you Attorney General, running for Attorney General, <laughs> right. Aaron Ford. And a little bit later in the show, Leslie Cohen, who's an assembly candidate, will be here. You helped uh, shepherd the Nevada Senate over the last several years. And, you know, and I, gotta be, you know, I have to say that I've been really proud of our Nevada legislature in the last couple of years. And, um, we were one of the only legislature, and probably the only legislature in the country in the last election that, uh, that the Democrats did pretty well in, mm -hmm. in taking back the, the legislature. And, but we've also been very independent-minded, doing what you know, people have voted in, in to do, irrespective of what the governor or attorney general may or may not have done at that time. Sure, sure. Right? I mean, so, so, you proud of what you, you did in the, in the uh, state senate? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, we have a great cadre of, of folks who've been elected to the state senate, to the state assembly as well. Um, and we worked very hard in the 2017 session to ensure that people were actually represented um, and not special interests uh, uh, and not narrow uh, agendas. And so uh, we are, we're proud of the work we put out there. Um, and I think what you're going to see on a going forward basis is, is a continued focus in that arena um, after this next election. Well, you know what I'm most proud of what you did, Aaron? Um, you were the majority leader of the state Senate. And when you look at what's going on in the Senate and in the House, mm -hmm. And you look at the majority leaders of both the United States Senate and the and the uh, and, and the House of Representatives. They seem to be very divisive. You were very good as a majority leader in bringing both parties and consensus together in getting people to pass legislation. Well, we, we tried to. One of the things that I said on the first day of the legislative session was that we will disagree, but we have to learn how to do it without being disagreeable. Um, and so I made every effort that I could to ensure that we had input, uh, conversation, deliberation over topics that were sometimes going to be controversial. Uh, to be sure, there are votes that are party line votes sometimes, right. but the vast majority of the things that we considered during the legislative session were bipartisan and almost unanimous. Uh, and that's what's lost on a lot of people. All that they, all that they see is the, the bickering and the fighting and, and the disagreements, and, and they don't see the efforts that we've undertaken and the success we've had in ensuring that people have buy-in and we get bipartisan and oftentimes unanimous support for different bills and ideas. And what's the best way to do that, to give people an opportunity to be heard, to listen? I mean, Well, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I always say as well is that I know that I don't know everything about everything. Uh, and so understanding that people have different perspectives, understandings, experiences that they bring to the table, uh, and, open, and making myself open and welcome to hearing what those uh, suggestions are and what those experiences are helps, I think, the entire process. Uh, there were um, ideas, bills, suggestions that were brought up at the beginning of session, for example, that were ultimately uh, abandoned because conversation took place and people were able to see that this is not such a good idea after all, or this will have more of a negative effect than benefit, and so uh, they were able to be introspective and determine that they're not going to pursue certain bills, but it comes from conversation. Right. It comes from being uh, amenable to having a communication, and it comes from uh, ensuring that you have the opportunity to compromise as opposed to only saying it's my way or the highway. And how do you bring those skills into an attorney general's position? Well, I think, again, the Attorney General's office is, is, is an opportunity to listen. Uh, it's an opportunity to hear from those who've, who've sent you to that office, uh, understanding what it is their priorities are. When I'm asked what my priorities are or will be as Attorney General, uh, the answer is simple. It's going to be determined by what the priorities are of the people who sent me there. Uh, and so having conversations with students, for example, who are telling me that they're concerned about their safety, whether it's in elementary schools or in college, means that school safety is a concern and issue of mine as Attorney General. Uh, when I talk to senior, senior citizens who are concerned about being scammed on the Internet or uh, on, on phone calls, uh, then that becomes a priority of mine. Uh, and, and so that, that's the way the Attorney General's office can be utilized to ensure that we're focusing on people in Nevada families, again, as opposed to a narrow or extreme agenda. Are, are there laws currently to protect, you know, seniors from these scams and these telephone calls? I mean, I keep getting, I don't know if you get this in your phone, but I keep getting these calls from people saying uh, that there's a warrant for my arrest and then they call this number and uh, pay some money and we'll get rid of the warrant. Sure. I mean, you get those phone calls too? I, I get, I get <laughs> prank phone calls like that yeah. all the time as well. Um, you know, the story that I've given recently, uh, you know, my father unfortunately passed away uh, two months ago yesterday. Um, about two months ago. 
Monday actually. And we were home um, a week later or so for the funeral and my wife and I were driving back to my mom's home in Dallas, which is where um, uh, my, my family lives. And we got a frantic phone call from my mother-in-law who was around 78 years old. Uh, and, and she said, I just got a phone call from Avery. That's my oldest son, he's 25 years old. And she says, he says he's been in a car accident. Uh, his nose is broken, yeah, it's all yeah. bloody. Uh, the co police are on the scene and they're saying that if I don't send him this money right now, they're going to arrest him. Um, and my wife says, well, let's call Avery. And she says, I called him. It wasn't him. It was a scammer, right. someone who knew to call granny, 78-year-old granny, and call her granny, not grandmother, not grandma, but granny, uh, knew who my son was and attempted to get money out of her. So when I talk about protecting people from things like this, I'm not talking about what I've heard, Ed. I'm talking about what I know. My own family has experienced this, and it's something that the Attorney General is supposed to be responsible for uh, protecting our people from. Right, so I mean, those are things that we can prosecute, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so we just have... Yeah. I mean, the difficulty, obviously, is, is finding the perpetrators, yeah. but uh, absolutely, the Attorney General needs to have, um, uh, working with the legislature, have protocols in place to help protect um, Nevada citizens mm -hmm. from those types of pre uh, predators. Attorney General's office is the largest law firm in the state, right? You employ more lawyers than mm -hmm. any other Anybody law else? firm in the state, right? And right. you'd be running the... the the biggest law firm. So what's important and when you're running a law firm like that and you have so many attorneys working for you, how do you um, develop the culture that you have? Yeah. You know, I, I think, uh, again, that speaks to what we've seen happen in the state Senate. I, I do believe it starts at the top. I do believe that understanding that I am not of, uh, a master of everything that, that is presented to me and so understanding that there are experts in the fields that are surrounding me. Um, I read a long time ago, working on one of my degrees back in the day, that the definition of a good leader is someone who surrounds himself with people who have strengths where his or her weaknesses are. Uh, and so understanding that we have uh, career um, uh, deputies, attorney, uh, deputy attorneys general who have been working and acting in places that uh, I may not have as much famili familiarity with, relying upon them and their expertise. Uh, and letting them know that uh, their experience is going to count, that it's going to matter, uh, that to be sure I will have priorities in the office, but I'm going to look for help to implement those priorities through people uh, who have the expertise in those areas. Uh, and, and I think that's, that, that goes a long way to developing a, a positive culture. Nevada is a very large and diverse state. I know as you're campaigning around the state, I mean, there's a huge difference between um, Reno compared to Las Vegas compared to Elko, Winnemuc. I mean, there, it goes on and on, probably. Right. I mean, they're all so different. What are you hearing um, in different parts of the state from, you know, from people and what their, you know, concerns are in this election cycle? Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest issues uh, people are raising, whether I'm in rural Nevada or um, in Las Vegas or in Reno, is they want uh, an attorney general who's going to implement as opposed to impede the will of the people. Uh, and specifically, they're talking about the implementation of the background checks. Uh, so that's one of the issues that's very can important. Can you explain it? We currently have um, background checks? We, we do have a system of background checks, but there was a, um, a background check initiative petition that was passed a few years ago right. uh, that the current attorney general has indicated was... Um, it was voted on, right? It was we, voted on. It was voted on. It was people passed, passed it, and uh, we hoped or thought, people who voted for it, that, that, uh, that it would be implemented, right? right. Right. And so uh, there's been litigation has ensued. Um, I don't think all of the different uh, alternatives for implementation have taken place. And so I've said that I'm going to work with anyone that I can, whether it's the governor, uh, the legislature, the federal government, law enforcement, whoever, whoever the case, uh, whoever out there wants to work to implement this uh, is what I'm going to try to work to implement. And so that's one of the issues that I've heard throughout the state. Uh, Health care. Uh, is one of the biggest issues out there. In fact, when I put into the parking lot today, uh, I was talking to a gentleman in, in the parking lot who was saying that his main reason for opposing certain candidates is that they uh, have flip-flopped on the issue of health care. Um, he has health insurance for, he, for, for himself and his daughter, uh, and, and he is concerned about the fact that some Nevada politicians will not step up and stand up against getting rid of pre-existing conditions uh, and ensuring that, that Medicaid expansion is protected in the state. So uh, that's an issue that I hear uh, um, um, statewide as well. Yeah, I, I don't understand how anybody could be against uh, ensuring pre-existing conditions. Yeah. I mean, it's just mind-boggling to me. I mean, nobody, until you're sick, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're for it, right? Sure. Yeah, I mean, what is health care without, uh, it's, it's like, uh, it's like buying an, an insurance for something, and, um, and you know, and, um, and and it's not being available when you need it the most. Right. Exactly. Right. Your house burns down. Over oh, home. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, pre-existing condition. <laughs> um, early voting 
in Nevada has been you know, relatively successful. I think uh, close to 50 percent of people vote in early elections. Um, and we have a question on the ballot that is going to permit automatic Right. Registrations. What does that mean? Yeah, AVR is the acronym they use for it, automatic voter registration. Um, several other states, 14 or 15 or so other states, already do automatic voter registration. Uh, and what it does is, for example, I took my 17-year-old son um, just two weeks ago right. to the DMV to get his ID. Um, he'll be 18 by election day. He'll get to vote for, for the first time. And I took him to get his ID so that we can register him to vote. Um, and what, what automatic voter registration would have done was the minute that we took him to the DMV and he got his ID or his license, he would have been automatically registered to vote as opposed to having to fill out an additional form or, or go through an additional process. And so um, um, it's, it's a way to streamline the, the, the process. It's a, it's a way to ensure that only eligible voters are being um, um, registered to vote. Um, and so it, it offers integrity and security in that regard as well. Uh, so, you know, it's something that um, an initial petition was presented to us. We passed it in the, uh, maybe it wasn't an initial petition, but we passed this in the state legislature, mm -hmm. um, both through the assembly and through the Senate. We sent it to the governor's desk, um, um, and, and unfortunately he vetoed it, and so it's up to the people now to implement this, and uh, I strongly advocate it. And I think it's a good idea because, you know, they have this new federal law with your driver's licenses, right? You have this new uh, real federally, ID, yeah, real ID right. federally uh, mandated, and you have to bring additional ID right. with you when you mm -hmm. go down to the DMV, and they do um, all kinds of checking with power bills and, uh, and birth certificates and everything else. Right. So, and they verify, okay, with this ID, you're good enough to pass through TSA, sure. right? You can fly in and out of the airports, um, you're secure, you probably, uh, you know, you are who you say you are. Mm -hmm. So this opening that up to one more loop, okay, now you're also registered to vote, it, to me seems like a no-brainer. Yeah, I, I think it's a no-brainer as well. Um, yeah. uh, and, and the campaign is ongoing, uh, and I, I'm supporting it, and I'm encouraging your viewers to support it as well. I think that's question five. Question uh, five, on, right. Uh, ballot number five, uh, ballot issue five on the uh, ballot this year. Right, so, and uh, yeah, we hope that one wins. I mean, because getting people out to vote has got to be one of the most significant issues facing yeah. this country right and, now. And voting rights has been uh, a passion of mine um, for a long time, um, mm -hmm. and absolutely since I've been in the legislature. I, I've supported bills that have expanded the right, um, 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 the, the ability to vote, making it easier and fairer and more accessible to those who are eligible to vote. Um, um, I've, ins I've ensured that we don't put unnecessary necessary barriers in the places uh, in, in, in front of the ability to vote. Uh, um, and I think that, again, automatic voter registration helps to ensure that we have uh, a safe, secure um, uh, um, ele election system uh, through voter registration uh, that is secured through uh, integrity as well. But I was reading in the, the paper uh, this week, uh, Caesar's Palace uh, was uh, putting in some armed SWAT kind of teams, their own security. I saw it on the news this morning. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is the relationship with uh, security at the hotels, you know, our local police departments, you know, the, the state police, you know, they all work well together? So, yes, I mean, I think the short answer to that is absolutely. Um, yeah. um, there are several different um, opportunities, if you will, for coordination and cooperation between various branches of law mm -hmm. enforcement um, and security personnel. Uh, we have a Nevada um, um, Commission for Homeland Security, for example, on which I sit, uh, where a lot of us get together and talk through some of those issues. And it's not just law enforcement on there. There, there are legislators and uh, citizens and things of that sort, so that there can be a better cooperation and coordination of protection uh, of our homeland, i.e. the state here, uh, from terrorist attacks or what have you. And so uh, I think those, those uh, opportunities exist now. Uh, and when I'm Attorney General, I would do all that I can to ensure that they re uh, retain and maintain. Last night I went to see uh, Fahrenheit 11-9. Mm -hmm. And a part of, of, of the movie, they were talking about what happened in Flint, Michigan with mm -hmm. the water. Mm -hmm. And it was really a, a corrupt situation. Mm -hmm. You know, you really had uh, uh, some policy, some really bad politics that changed the water from a very clean water source and beautiful, serene, you know, uh, uh, Great Lakes into uh, the, the Flint River. Mm -hmm. And people, uh, 10,000 kids, had got lead poisoning, essentially. What role does the state have in protecting 
you know, consumers from that type of thing? Yeah, well, consumer protection is one of the main roles of the state attorney, attorney general, um, whether it's consumer protection in the arena of environmental protection or, or in other arenas that we just mentioned, for example, the scams against seniors. Mm -hmm. uh, consumer protection is something that um, has been a priority of mine in the state senate, where I passed bills to protect um, um, our citizens from scams, but also will be a role of mine in the attorney general's office. And so when you talk about the uh, violation of environmental protection laws, the attorney general uh, does play a role in that. And what you've seen, frankly, nationally, is the coalition of Democratic attorneys general have sued the federal administration, has sued the federal administration, for example, on efforts and attempts to roll back environmental standards, whether it relates uh, to emissions from cars or, or, or offshore drilling, whatever the case may be. And so uh, that is an opportunity, again, for the attorney general um, um, to participate in something that's putting it out of families first as opposed yeah. to, um, you know, in special interests. Thank you, uh, Aaron Ford, uh, running for Attorney General. If you bring with you the same leadership skills that you had in the State Senate, we'll be in good hands in, uh, in the Thank Attorney you. General's office. We'll be right back with uh, Leslie Cohen, a candidate for uh, Assembly. When sorry is not enough. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com. I'm back with Assemblywoman uh, Leslie Cohen. Hey, your last term in the legislature, I and mean, I spoke to uh, uh, Senator Ford, currently running for Attorney General, about how effective our legislature has been. What are you most proud of uh, in the last term? You know, I'm really proud that we were able to save the solar industry. That's such an important industry for us, not only because it's better for our environment, but it brings with it such good paying jobs that can't be shipped overseas. Yeah, when you talk about good paying jobs, uh, this week uh, Amazon just uh, made a, an announcement that they're taking tens of thousands of their employees and raising everybody's minimum wage to $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. Is that a good thing? Well, certainly yeah. it's a good thing for those employees and I, I think it's going to be good for Amazon in the long run. They're going to see like companies like Costco that have good benefits and good pay, that they're going to keep their employees happy, they're going to uh, stay there, they're going to be worth the investment. Right. Speaking of Costco, is it one opening up right near on the outside of your area, right? Right, close in, to in it. In Henderson, off of Lake Mead. Right. You're in the Henderson area. I am. The old, Hender, old original Henderson area. Right. Green Valley parts. Yeah. Right. So my district is the older part of Green Valley into the older part of Henderson and a sliver of Silverado Ranch. It's it's a very interesting shaped district. Right. So when you walk around door to door, which is you know what you do. I know you do that. Um, yeah. What are you hearing from people? What, what are they concerned about other than the mess in Washington? Right. Well, I always ask people at the door, what issues are most important to you for Nevada? And 80% of the time, I'd say it's education or health care or education and health care. And, of course, education. This year has been a kind of a landmark year for, year for education around the country. You saw several states where teachers went on strike because they were not getting livable wages. They were having, uh, not getting uh, health care benefits. I mean, they just weren't getting the kind of benefits that they need, and they went on strike in a lot of states. Where do you see Nevada teachers? I definitely see people at the doors, uh, and, and this has changed over the years. We've, we've talked about education at the doors for a long time, and now I am hearing from people at the doors specifically, we need to pay teachers more. We were able to accomplish that somewhat in the last legislative session for teachers at Title I schools, but the plan is to bring teachers up to the national average in the next legislative session. And part of that plan was to take the tax uh, derived from marijuana and put it back into education, and, and it, it really hasn't happened that way? It, it actually has. There's been a lot of confusion about that. So we have followed what was in the ballot initiative for marijuana. That money has gone into education. Now, in the last legislative session, the Democrats in the legislature did want to put more tax funds into education. And there was a dispute with the Republican side of the aisle where they basically you know, used it as a bargaining chip. And because the legislative session is 120 days, there comes a time where the governor has to close his budget and, it, and it's done. And so that's basically what happened. The governor had to close his budget, and so that money that we were hoping would go to education ended up going toward uh, the governor's rainy day fund. Now, our... Um, leader in the assembly has already put in the bill request for the next legislative session to try to pr move that money back into education. 
Yeah, because, I mean, we're competing with, you know, 49 other states on, you know, to get the best teachers we can get right. here in Nevada, right? So we need to pay them a salary so they don't have to work two or three jobs to, to pay their, their mortgage. I agree. Mental health has been a big issue of, of, of yours. Um, I think there's a direct link between, uh, you know, the homeless problem and the people in the street and mental health uh, and how well our mental health or how unwell our mental health system really is. Uh, what can we do to fix mental health in I, Nevada? You know, much like education and healthcare in general, there are no easy answers. Uh, I think we did make some strides in the last legislative session. For instance, we expanded the hours for our mobile healthcare clinics. Uh, we're funding the UNLV Medical School more thoroughly now so that we can get professionals here, we can train them, we can retain them, and I think we have to continue working toward that. The um, health care in Nevada um, so far has been pretty good. I mean, um, our state has kind of held firm. A lot of states have kind of buckled and lost some of the um, benefits that they got from the Affordable Care Act. Um, what would you like to see for health care in general in Nevada? Well, we did pass Medicaid for All in the last legislative mm -hmm. session, and unfortunately that was vetoed. I think we're going to see that come back. And I think it's important for us to, again, to attract more health care professionals and then keep them here. We are, what, num number 50 in the, the percentage of doctors in this country. Nevada has the worst ratio of doctors um, of any state in the country. We passed medical malpractice reform years ago. They said that was the problem why doctors were coming. It wasn't the problem. Doctors still don't come. So what can we do to attract doctors? Well, a lot of it does have to do with the medical school. Uh, that statistically, we know that people that train in a state, do their residency in a state, will stay in that state. So I think that's important. We've also talked in the legislature about things like telemedicine and different ways we can uh, use technology to improve our health care system. Right. And, um, and having better insurance, you, you think that would attract the doctors and I think definitely it would give people more options. It would make sure that they had the ability to pay for um, health care. You know, another thing we passed in the legislature last session uh, was had to do with uh, emergency room visits, that people were going to the emergency room and because they had an emergency. And it wasn't until later they found out that that was considered out of network and so they ended up with huge bills and and that's just not right so we passed some legislation about that in the last legislative session um, unfortunately that was also vetoed so I'd like to see us dealing with that as well so that people uh, know don't have to worry about something like that when they have an emergency the other big uh, cost in health care is the cost of prescription drugs right and I, I know that's always an issue uh, on your mind as a legislator Right, and we did pass legislation to prevent the companies from raising the cost of prescriptions. One of the things uh, that they proposed federally is letting insurance companies compete in multiple states uh, instead of, and just opening up, let as many insurance companies come into any state. Um, are you in favor of that? I, I think as long as we've got enough regulation, it, it might be something that would be beneficial, but we do want to make sure that we're putting the needs of Nevadans first with health care. Right, and because each state can require what it expects from an insurance company, what coverages they must provide, right? Right. So we, we want to make sure that, that, that critical health care um, issues are provided for in policies in Nevada and that insurance companies don't come into our state not offering certain types of coverages. Correct. Right? I mean, that's, that's the big issue. Uh, of course, another um, issue, and I was just uh, was discussing it with, uh, with uh, uh, Aaron Ford, was the, um, the voting initiatives, uh, mm -hmm. you know, trying to make it easier to vote instead of making it more restrictive. I mean, we have a country that has one of the lowest voting percentage rates of any, um, any, any, any democracy in the world. We just, for some reason, people are just either disenfranchised or not interested. And what can we do in Nevada to, to help that? 
Right, it's, it's interesting, you know, you really do get to know a community when you canvass in that community and you find out a lot that you wouldn't necessarily see otherwise. So for instance, when I'm knocking at doors, I knock at the doors of people who are registered voters. I can pass a whole street where no one's registered to vote. And it's, it's just such a shame. I think the ballot initiative uh, is something that would help. It's, you know, it's automatic voter registration through the DMV. It's safe and it's going to get more of us voting. All right. It's got to be frustrating to pass a whole street because there's not a registered voter on that street. Right. Maybe somebody needs to go to those streets handing out voter registration cards. Well, and yeah. people have done a lot of work with voter registration in this state, but you know, there's there's only so many efforts that can be put forward. But this is a good way to get it done. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, legislators have been term limited out uh, in the assembly, in the state senate, or they're running for other positions. And you have a you know you're going to have some new blood coming in. Um, what's your feeling about that? I mean, is, is it kind of, uh, you know, you lose some of the experience and, and some of the know-how, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's, you know, you do lose some institutional knowledge, yeah. and so that is, that is a shame to some extent, but I think it's, it's always good to have new people who are, uh, have bring fresh ideas and, and aren't necessarily caught up in fights from the past. They're, they don't have... Uh, access to grind. Yeah. Right, they don't have access to grind. I think, yeah. you know, one of the exciting things about the legislature coming up is that we may be the first female majority legislature in the, state, in the country, uh, which is really exciting. And if we are, what, would you, what kind of changes would you expect from that? Well, you know, first let's be clear, it's not just voting women into office to have women in office. It's we're more than 50% of the electorate, we're more than 50% of Nevada residents, so it's important to have us at the table. Mm -hmm. And I think we do things in a different way, we bring a different perspective, and it's important to really look at everyone's perspective and for everyone to feel that they're represented at the table. And we know that when women do better, families do better, and when families do better, Nevada does better. You get no disagreement from me as a man with a wife and uh, six uh, girls, daughters, um, and totally I'm a believer in women's intuition. Right. And uh, knowing what's right and what's wrong. Because most of the time, women are correct. <laughs> More than men. Uh, thank you very much, Leslie Cohen, uh, assembly, uh, an incumbent uh, okay. assembly person running for re-election. Good luck and keep up the good work. Thank you. I really thank appreciate you. it. Okay. Good thing you have insurance. The lady in front of you just called that Bernstein. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com.